Good morning, good morning. Welcome to another episode of uh, Exodus. And now I have the right picture up there this time. <laughs> didn't even notice I had the wrong one up there yesterday. So hopefully that didn't confuse people too much. But I didn't want to re-record the whole thing either. Uh, so uh, I left it. A little advertiser. That's the uh, course I'm doing on Sunday mornings in a Sunday school class. So if it's a subject that interests you, please join us on Sunday mornings. So let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for this time we have to look in your word. And uh, thank you, Lord, and help us to uh, do it in a way that's meaningful and helpful to the people. And we give you all the praise and thanks for all you do and helping us to understand your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So again, we continue. This is almost a repeat, uh, and as you'll see with this particular graphics I'm going to use. We saw this first one, uh, in chapters uh, 25. We're going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant today, along with the mercy seat and the table of showbread. So we, we kind of analyzed this quite a bit during the time we were in chapter 25. and we're going to, So I'm just going to highlight a lot of the things we talked about there. There's not a lot of new information, but if there is anything, I'll mention it uh, between those two things. And just see where the Holy Spirit leads us. So again, I get these graphics of what we're looking at in these pictures. And uh, I get my verses doing here. There they are. And so I started in chapter 37. And uh, I'm going to take on verse 17 verses today. And then we'll take the second half of the chapter tomorrow. So starting here in verse 1. And here's our, here's our uh, craftsman. Uh, he's uh, in charge of everything. Bezalel. I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. Bezalel. I'll go with Bezalel. Made the ark of the ship in the wood. Two cubits and a half was the length of it, and a cubit and a half the breadth of it, and a cubit and a half the height of it. And as you remember, we talked a lot about the cubit. I can be anywhere from 18 to 20 inches, typically. So uh, we were going with the 18-inch idea. So this thing would be about three feet long and about uh, uh, three, no, three, uh, two cubits and a half. So that's 18, 36, say 40 inches long. And it was a cubit and a half breadth. So that's about 24 inches wide. And we just uh, get my <clears throat> you can see the sides of it. There's a side view there a little bit. <coughs> and a cubit and a half the height of, so again, back to uh, 24, about 30 inches high. Ain't real big, but it's covered in completely in gold. Uh, so I'm sure it's not light. You see that uh, we're going to talk about those two rods to help carry it. Probably carried by two men, maybe four. Uh, depending on, uh, I'm not sure the exact weight, how much that would weigh with that much gold on it. But you also got the top, which is on it too. And that's the, uh, and that's the mercy seat. Two separate items. Uh, they're not the same item. They're considered separate. And right now we're talking about just the bottom half, this Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. So when it says Covenant, then what's going to be on the inside is those tables of stone we've been talking about. Okay, verse 2. He overlaid it with pure gold, with and without, so it's both on the inside and the outside, made a crown of gold to round about it. And he cast in it four rings of gold to be set by the four corners of it, even two rings upon the one side of it and two rings upon the other side of it. That's for the uh, for the staffs there. He made staffs of shipped in wood and overlaid them with gold. And he put the staffs into the rings by the sides of the ark to bear the ark. So the long history of the ark of the covenant begins at Mount Sinai. That's where it's built, where the ark was built. Throughout its history, the ark contained the tables of the law. That's we see a reference to that in the first Kings 8 and 9, 8 verses 9. 
There was nothing in the ark save the two tablets of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt. And for a time also a golden pot containing manna and Aaron's rod. Uh, see a reference to that in Hebrews 9, 4. Which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. Wherein was a golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded. We won't get into Aaron's rod that budded until way later on. And the tables of the covenant. The ark ordinarily was kept in the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle during the journeys of the Israelites and was carried by the priests or the Kohithonites of the tribe of Levi. We see that in Numbers 33, verses 30 and 31. And the chief of the house of the father, the families of the Kohithonites, shall be uh, Lithophon, the son of Uzael. And their child shall be the ark and the table and the candlestick and the altars and the vessels of the sanctuary wherein they, they minister and the hanging and all the service thereof. So again, all this whole tabernacle too is the responsibility of the Levites. They carry it, they, they set it up, they take care of it, uh, they repair it if necessary. And after Solomon built the temple, it was kept there. And we see a reference to that in 1 Kings 8, 6 through 9. And the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord unto his place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the Ark, and the cherubims covered the Ark and the stars thereof above. We get to the temple. There's actually two other cherubims, statutes that are, that are huge, and they're inside the same place. So that's what it's kind of referencing here, too. But these two cherubims on top of the Ark, let's get to in the mercy seat. And they drew out the staves, and the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and they were there until this day. One difference between the temple and this is that because this is temporary, those staves stay in there. They never take them out. They will as soon as it gets to its uh, residence in the temple. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. A little repeat on that verse. The ark accompanied the children of Israel on their journeys throughout the wilderness, and at Jericho it preceded uh, the army. That was a very interesting time in Joshua 6, 9. We'll get to that someday if the Lord tarries. And the armed men went before the priests, and that blew with the trumpets, and the re reward, re reward came after the ark. Re reward is, uh, in Hebrew, means gathering. So it blew with the trumpets, and it, and Basically, you could replace gathering there. And the gathering came after the ark. The priest going on and blowing with the trumpets. The ark's frequent mention in scripture testifies to its prominence in Israel. And there's a whole bunch of verses I got here. I'll just read a few. We've already read Numbers uh, 331. It's also in Numbers 1033. Joshua 3, 3 through 17. We read part of that. And also in Joshua 6, 4. I read Judges 20, 27. And then the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. 1 Samuel 3, 3. And the men of uh, Kirthic Jagam uh, came and hit, fixed up the Ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of uh, Abibadad in the hill and sanctified Eleazar, his son, to keep the Ark of the Lord. And a whole bunch of places in 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 4, a lot of it, chapter 5. Chapter 6, most of it. Uh, chapter 7, um, a couple of verses there I'll mention. 1 Samuel 7, uh, 1 and 2. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Cathar and Jam that the uh, time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Also in 2 Samuel uh, 6, uh, most of the chapter. <clears throat> In 2 Samuel 7, 2, I'll read that one. That the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within the curtains. And going on also in 2 Samuel 15, 24 through 29. And also 1 Kings 8, almost the whole chapter. Uh, so, again, lots of places. And I think that's just that's a, a short list. Because here we are here in uh, uh, 
talking about it here in Exodus quite a bit too. So the description of the furnishings of the tabernacles begins with the ark, which, as already stated, was placed in the Holy of Holies, because in Revelation, God begins from himself, working outward towards men. As in the approach, the worshiper begins from himself, moving toward God in the Holy of Holies. The same order is followed in the Levitical uh, offerings in Leviticus uh, chapters 1 through 5. I think I'm just going to continue moving, working my way through the Bible. So unless it's a chapter, a book I've already done, I'm just going to probably hit Leviticus next. An approach man begins at the brazen altar, which is a type of Christ uh, cross where the in the fire of judgment, atonement is made. So we kind of went through that yesterday when I was talking about uh, as we come in through the front gate, only one way into the area uh, through, the, uh, through the front gate. And the first thing you see is the uh, uh, brazen altar. We'll get to that uh, probably tomorrow or the next day. But that's the first. So that's man coming towards God and God being the last step where this is kept. Now, from God's standpoint, and that's what we're looking at here. It starts at the Ark of the Covenant and works its way out towards man. <laughs> the Ark could not be spoken of as a merely a wooden chest because it also was a gold chest. It could not be called a gold chest because it also had a chest of wood. It required both gold and wood to maintain the symbolism pointing to Christ as God, that's the gold, and as man, that's the wood. We've been talking about this quite a bit when we talked about the actual tabernacle, the same idea, the wood being the uh, man and the gold being of God. <clears throat> there is no mingling of the two. To overlook this du duality is to entertain the monstrous notion of his person. There is no doctrine in Scripture so filled with infinite mystery and so removed from the realm of explanation as a hypostatic union of Christ, the God-man. Uh, yet there is no symbol so simple as the ark that distributes the union of God and man in one body. A mere box made of wood and gold speaks of things unfathomable. Truly God chooses the simple things that confound the wise. That simple box tells the whole story, as far as man can take it, of the unsearchable mystery of the blessing, blessed person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a uh, statement by uh, uh, J. Vernon McGee. I think you've probably gotten used to his, uh, the way he speaks. Great man of God. The ark was covered with gold, both inside and outside. Colossians 2.9 mentions this. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ was not merely a uh, thermatic, thermatic, thermatic guest, which basically means a wonder worker, nor was he a man with an overdeveloped God conscious. He was God. He spoke as God. He put himself in the same plane as God. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And jump into verse 9 through 11. Jesus said to them, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Philip was asking to show the Father. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how saith then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? This is Jesus speaking, by the way. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. Uh, so our Savior says, yes, he was God, but he was also perfectly man. He grew tired. He sat down to rest as well in the Samaria. If you remember the, the, the famous uh, woman at the well story, in the heat of the day, he slept, he ate, he drank, he laughed, he wept, and beyond all that, he suffered and died. All of these human characteristics, I could point a verse to every single one of those, easily. The gold and the wood and the ark were uh, both required, yet neither was mingled with each other, nor was the identity of one lost in the other. Christ was both God and man, but the two natures were never fused or merged. You know, you can't mix wood with gold or vice versa. He was never functioned at the same time as both God and man. What he did was either perfectly human or perfectly divine. And I truly believe that. The ark was not an empty box. It contained three items, which are uh, enumerated in, in Hebrews 9.4. We read that already, but I'll read it again. Had the, uh, we, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant, 
overlaid round about with gold, wherein was a golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded in the tables of the covenant. So the contents of the ark were also symbolic. Aaron's rod that budded speaks to the Lord's resurrection. In other words, the stick was dead. It was just a bare stick. But overnight, it grew a, it grew a fig, so it, it came back to life. The manna speaks of the fact that God is the bread of life. And the Ten Commandments speak of the life he lived on earth, fulfilling the law in all points and fulfilling the prophecies spoken of him. <clears throat> so the tables of the covenant speak of the kingship of Christ. He was born a king. He lived a king. He died a king. He rose from the dead as a king. Uh, he is coming again to earth as a king. God, God's program is moving today and has been moving from eternity past to the time when Christ shall rule over the earth. A lot of this is uh, Dr. McGee again. I just love uh, the way he talks about things. So I'm plagiarizing his words, but I'm not trying to sell them. So, <laughs> and, um, but but uh, to, to finish up here, earth needs a ruler and man needs a king. Someday he is coming as king of kings and lord of lords. Amen to that. And the pot of manna speaks of Christ as a prophet. He spoke for God as, uh, as in John 6, 32 through 35. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, labor more, give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Clearly shows Jesus Christ was also God's messenger to man. He was Logos, the word of God, the very alphabet of God, the Alpha and the Omega. He is God's final message to man. Since Christ came to earth as God-man, heaven has been silent because God has no agenda addenda to place after Christ. He has no postscript to the letter because Christ is the embodiment of that letter. God told out of his heart his, is Christ. <clears throat> then Aaron's rod that budded speaks of the work of Christ as priest. The prophetic spoke for God before a man. Uh, it, that whole stick uh, thing chooses, it, it decides who the uh, who the uh, the keepers of the tabernacle were going to be, and it ended up being Aaron, which is the uh, uh, which is the uh, tribe of Levi. The priest spoke for man before God. As priest, Christ, as priest, Christ offered himself as a priest. He passed into heaven. Even now, he sits at the God's right hand in heaven. Jesus Christ, the God man who raised from the dead, and he is a unique example of resurrection up to the present hour. Easter lilies and eggs do not speak of the resurrection, but Aaron's rod that budded does. It was an old dead stick that came alive. The ark speaks of the Christ as prophet, priest, and king. John 1.14 <clears throat> And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so there's the ark. <clears throat> Let me just throw some pictures here. Oh, we're not talking about the top part. We're going to get to that next. So just wanted to show you uh, the different angles. And there's the Ten Commandments on the inside. At this point in uh, Exodus, though, we only got the Ten Commandments. Okay, so let's now we're going to talk about the mercy seat. Go back a little bit. I think that's far enough. <clears throat> mercy seat. Mercy seat. Now read verses six through nine. He made the mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half was the length thereof, and one cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Same size as the box in length and width. And he made two cherubims of gold beaten out of one piece, made he them, on the two ends of the mercy seat. So they are pure gold, and they, are, uh, they were beaten out of one piece of gold. They weren't like fashioned together. <clears throat> one, cherub on the end of, uh, one cherub on the end on this side, and another cherub on the other end of that side. Out of the mercy seat made he the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim spread out their wings on high and covered it with their wings over the mercy seat, with their faces one to another, even to the mercy seat, uh, 
seaward were the faces of the cherubims. I think there's a picture in here of that. There you can see their faces facing each other. I can see that underneath. <clears throat> I don't know if it shows the other one or not. There's a good picture where you can see them both looking at each other. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> the mercy seat rested on top of the ark. It served as the top for the chest, the ark, but it was a separate piece of furniture. It was made of pure gold with cherubim on each end with their wings spread, overshadowing it, and looking down upon the top where the blood was placed. It was here the highest priest sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice. It was the blood that made it the mercy seat. This too was symbolic of the work of Christ. Christ literally presented his blood in heaven after his death on the cross. Peter calls his Savior's blood precious. It's in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversations are received by the tradition of your fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Christ's blood is more precious than silver or gold. The most valuable thing in heaven is the blood he shed for man on earth. He presented his blood as he entered heaven, and that is what makes God's throne a mercy seat for us today. I truly believe that, uh, remember that scene where Jesus said to Mary, don't touch me, I go to be the, with the Father. I believe he was on his way up to heaven to actually put the uh, blood on the actual mercy seat in heaven. We are bidden to come to God today on the basis of that fact, that Jesus Christ, our great high peace, has offered his own blood for our sins. So Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 reminds us of this. Seeing that they, we have a great high priest that is passed into heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He fully realizes everything we go through. He has, he has gone through it himself. But was in all points tempted like as we are, but without sin. <clears throat> let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So you and I approach God through our great high priest in heaven. He is the living Christ at God's right hand. Though him we find mercy and help, many believers are trying to fight the battle down here alone. They are trying to meet the issues of life alone. Friends, you and I are not able to do this. We are not strong enough. We need help. And we are not availing ourselves to the help Christ offers. <laughs> Paul prayed for the Ephesians that, they mightily, that, that the mighty power that worked in Christ bringing him from the dead work might work in uh, work in them also that's in Ephesians 1 19 and 20 so where Paul met with the Ephesian elders if you remember before he left for good uh, knowing he was not going to come back <clears throat> and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us would who believe according to the work of his mighty power <clears throat> which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places so we see very little of that power working in believers today. Uh, unfortunately, the, the church has become a place of uh, more of a social club uh, than anything, I think. So the question is, have you talked to the Lord today? You should speak to him every single day. <clears throat> okay, so that's the mercy seat. And I just finished up these. This is going to be the temple that has the actual... Uh, this is the depiction of the first temple. Uh, and there's a good picture where you can see these uh, the cherubims themselves. Okay, so now, I'm going, now we're going to talk about the table of showbread. This is the table of showbread. It's also a type of Christ. This is the bread of God, nourisher of Christian's life as a believer priest. So let's look at these verses here in 
Verse 10, and he made the table of shittin wood, two, two cubits was the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. He overlaid it with pure gold and made thereunto a crown of gold round about. And he made thereunto a border of a hand breadth round about and made a crown of gold with a border thereof round about. And he cast for it four rings of gold and put the rings upon the four corners that were in the four feet thereof. Over against the border were the rings, the, the places for the staves to bear the table. And he made the staves of shit and wood, and overlaid them with gold to, <coughs> to bear the table. And he made the vessels which were upon the table, his dishes and his spoons and his bowls, and his covers to cover with all of pure gold. Okay, so showbread, a type of Christ, as I just mentioned, the, bre the bread of God, nurture of the Christian's life as a believer priest. First Peter 2, 9 and 10 speaks of this. But ye are a chosen, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of darkness into the marvelous light which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And also in Revelation 1.6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So in John 6.33 through 58, it really spells this out. And so and that's going to be my primary verse for this. So I'm going to read through the whole 25 verses. Our Lord has more in mind than, than man, and I think this explains it, and it's from the Lord's mouth. <clears throat> it won't take too long to read through it, I don't think. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that you also have seen me and believe not. And all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. <clears throat> For I, am, I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him that sent me. <clears throat> <clears throat> and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up for la again the last day. Looking forward to that time. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And the Jews that murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which come down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he saith, I came down from heaven? And Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets that, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man may see the Father, say he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? 
And he, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Wherefore, eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. This is not talking about cannibalism or anything along that lines. Verse 56. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. This is, again, all symbolic of the fact that uh, when, we, when we are one with Christ, we are, we are uh, basically physically indwelled in him. And I think that's the idea they're trying to portray there. So, as we just read, our Lord has more in mind than manna, the food which came down from heaven. But all typical meaning of bread are there gathered into his words. The manna is the life-giving Christ, the showbread, the life-sustaining Christ. So the manna was the life-giving Christ, and then the showbread is the life-sustaining Christ. The showbread typifies Christ as the grain of wheat. We see that in John 12, 24. Barely, barely, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Again, that's the idea of Jesus going into the ground and raising again. In the mill of suffering, and that's in John 12, 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. And brought into the fire of judgment. That's in... Uh, John 12, 31 and 33. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from earth, will draw all men unto me. This he says, signifying what death he should die. So again, uh, this is all symbolic of the fact that Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross. So we as priests by faith feed upon him as having undergone that in our stead and for our sakes. It is a meditation upon Christ as in uh, Hebrews 12, 2 and 3 tells us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the, for the joy that was set before him endureth the cross, despising the shame and is set down to right hand of the throne of God. For considering him that endureth such contradiction of sinners against himself, Lest ye be worried and faint in your minds. So that's the show, bread. Not sure why that verse is there. Let's go on to verse 17. I'm, uh, that's the next step. We'll get to that tomorrow. So that's the show, bread. And uh, that ends today. We'll stop there for now. And we will look at the next set of items, uh, which is the uh, uh, candlestick and the uh, candlestick and the uh, uh, ark of, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, the altar of incense and then the uh, different ointments. Those are the next uh, items we're going to be looking at. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for this time, and thank you for all that you've given us. And uh, help us to be uh, ever mindful of all the things that you've taught us, that we can use them in, uh, in, our, in our daily lives. And we praise you and thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we'll talk to you again tomorrow. <laughs>